John Calvin wrote this about the church. He said, the church is the place where the gospel is preached. The gospel is good news. Good news makes people happy. Happy people sing. But then too, unhappy people may sing in order to cheer themselves up. Uh, One commentator has taken that encouragement and turned it into a warning sign for the front door of the church. It sounds like this. Enter at your own risk. Within these doors, your pride is in danger of melting into exuberant joy. I suppose what both those lines are getting at is the encouragement of the gospel and its joy. We can measure churches in all kinds of ways. In fact, in the not too distant future, the Presbytery Consultation Committee will come here to Bally Gilbert. They'll check in with us. They will see how we're doing. Sounds good. But a lot of the questions will be about the ABCs of the church. And by that we mean attendance, buildings, and cash. Now, are those the best health markers of a body of Christ's people? Well, I would argue they're not. Imagine instead if we were to be measured on our joy for the Lord and his good news, the gospel and the joy it presses into us and onto us. This is the nature of God's encouragement to us. We're going to linger this morning in Isaiah 55, but it's worth knowing a little bit about the previous chapter as well. So we'll start there. Isaiah 54 is all about reversals. Ray Ortland calls it a chapter of surprising reversals. Now, in it, we will see a woman who is barren, rejoicing over a growing family. We see a wife comforted by her husband, brought back to her after a separation. And we see a city that was robbed and then poor, restored to wealth and jewels. And these are more than just reversals of circumstances, but also removals of shame. And in those removals, a rescue from them, the people are encouraged to switch their point of view from only themselves to the Lord and what he has done for them. Just think of the miracles we've studied together. The view is taken off the people and the problems and placed squarely on Jesus and his answer to the situation. In him, we find the joy of faith, the joy of the gospel, and our salvation. Isaiah 54 teaches us that we are all struggling and dying. We are not about to save ourselves or the rest of the world, but God can And God has. And that's what sets up the continued encouragements we hear in Isaiah 55. Encouragements towards joy and gladness. That joy and gladness are encouraged in a few different ways. The first encouragement from God is to come freely. He says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come Buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. That is God's message to all the earth, to all of us. Someone else has paid, so come freely. It's so important that we hear it again at the very close of the Bible. Jesus says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Part of the encouragement of words like these is that they aren't just words. They're an invitation to an experience. But we can know a lot. We can know a lot about God and Jesus and the Spirit and the Bible. But Christian joy is in the experience of salvation. It's like when we used to go to street markets or farmers' fairs with the stalls and the vendors and the free samples. With no money required, we can taste what is good. We all know someone who might take the mick with a free sample. I used to see it when I worked in Sainsbury's 
The free samples were brought out and you could spot the kids and a few adults as well doing the laps and getting a second, third, fourth bite for free. Where the sellers would want you to buy something as part of that bargain, God makes sure here that we know someone has already paid. Salvation is free, so come freely. When we come freely, we're also to listen carefully, attentively, because God doesn't deal in free samples or small bites. His offer is rich and lush and filling. Listen again. God says, listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourselves with rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. There is an an important shift in the metaphor. The picture and the poetry of the food and the water are replaced by God himself. God is the food we need to feed on. He is the goodness we receive. He is the one who nourishes us. And we can be confident and sure of that because there's no talk of the stomach here. We're to come, tilt our ears, listen and hear so that what? Your soul may live. Now that is the real us. The real you needs the real God. So we should come freely and be ready to listen carefully. So important to understand what we mean when we say we're encouraged to listen to God. It is, in fact, listening to Jesus. At the heart of this message is the Son. We're to listen to him. Now, much later on, God couldn't be clearer on this. In the presence of Jesus, he says to Peter, James, and John, this is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. You will never, hopefully, hear me preach my ideas to you. What you should hold me to is to preach God's words in Old and New Testaments and to pay particular attention to the words of the Lord Jesus. There is no other source of God's word and wisdom. Even the Spirit will drive us back again and again to the words and the work of Jesus. Now, you heard David uh, in Isaiah's reading. Isaiah is more than likely referring to David in the first instance. So when he says, Behold, I make him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that you did not know shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. That's a David picture. But even Isaiah knows there's another to come. And we surely know that only Jesus can save the world. That is an encouragement to us, but also a warning to others. In its context that we read into these well-known words, the words that come next, we must hear them the right way. They speak for themselves. God says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So we're to come freely, but perhaps urgently to listen carefully and take the time to behold Jesus savior of the world when we do all of that we won't be able to help ourselves from looking forward you might have all kinds of ideas about the future maybe about heaven or hell or about what kind of new earth we might live in when jesus returns but the rest of isaiah 55 actually lays it out for us it's part of the freely given nourishment and encouragement of the lord And he starts by prompting us to abandon our own human 
earthbound thinking. He reminds us, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, all by itself, that's a particularly strong putting in our place. We're not like God. We don't know everything. We can't imagine what it's all about, let alone what heaven might be like. We need God's view. But more important than that reminder is seeing those words in their context. We need to run into the whole section from 6 to verse 9. And then we really spot it. It says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now what that tells us is that we cannot really grasp God's grace to us. We understand the word grace. We know about things like being pardoned. But when we come to God, and think of ourselves honestly, we will always struggle to see why God saves us. Psalmist puts it this way, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Well, that's an encouragement as well towards a childlike resting in the Father's knowledge, the one who would cradle us and say, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. What was it Jesus said about us? Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So God will encourage us as his children in language and pictures that we can start to get. Because Isaiah goes on, he says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Now, what's the encouragement here? What is it we're looking forward to? It's the truth that all life flows from God. His words, his encouragements will add up to something. They will do their work. We might say that we don't try to keep the hope of the gospel alive. We're kept alive by the hope of the gospel. Like the rain, it's not something we can make happen. We only receive it. It's part of God's generosity. It's central to how he encourages us that he did not hold anything from us, even his son. And then finally, we get to look forward to a future that we can barely dream or imagine. You shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. What an encouragement to keep going, to keep trusting, to keep looking forward and keep looking up. And what a reminder that when we say everything will be all right, God means that. Everything, humanity, the very earth will be remade and renewed because of the power of salvation in Jesus. Short version, there is no encourager like God and there's no encouragement like this anywhere else we might look. What could possibly 
compete with this? Nothing. We come freely. We listen carefully. We behold Jesus and we look forward like no other people on earth. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we can barely grasp your encouragement to us, yet we dare to hope in it. In Jesus, we see it all coming true. So we pray for courageous hearts that trust always in you, your word, and in the success it will secure. Father, keep us in that frame of mind and on that mission, for we pray in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen.